All right, let's talk about ideas and why having them is a bad one. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to me talking about books, and not just books in general, but one specific book today, and that specific book is The Circumference of the World by Lavi Tidar. It came out yesterday, I read it yesterday, and then I got a crippling headache and couldn't record the video, so we're one day late, which is very much <laughs> the motto of my entire life, so here we are. I'll do the usual thing, which is I'll give a quick synopsis um, that is completely spoiler-free, and then we'll move into a larger discussion, which may contain some spoilers. For the plot, I'll not spoil the entire ending, because I don't think it's necessary for what I want to say. But just be forewarned. Also, just go and read the fucking thing. It's not that long. What are you waiting for? It's six hours on audio, so like 250 pages. You can do that very quickly. And then we can have a lot of fun. And, well, I'll give you some reasons now, and then we'll talk about why it's such a brilliant book. Because I had a lot of fun with it. All right, so what is the circumference of the world all about? Well, that's that's kind of hard to say. It is a weird, weird story that is all about science fiction and the power of science fiction and the glory of science fiction and also very much not Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard. Um, very much not. Um, explicitly not. Um, is my point. See, this is a story that is told through very different means. It starts out as a story of three, four different people that all get kind of caught up in the search for a paperback science fiction novel from the 1960s that may or may not contain, uh, contain the actual truth about the universe and so forth. It was written by someone who was a science fiction pulp writer and later on started a religion and, um, well... That's kind of the layout for the whole story. And it starts like that, and then it moves into more like a collection of letters and anecdotes and memoirs and pieces of fiction within that story. And uh, so it's it's very meta. But it, it all deals with that question of, like, is that book real? Does it actually exist? Can we find it? Is it actually the thing it claims to be? Does it contain the truth? And can it save humanity? Or... Well, is it maybe just a science fiction story? And it, that's the kind of question that we'll deal with all over the place. Until then, it's sort of like a detective story in a lot of ways, and then has a lot of, like, um, letters. If you've read, like, you know, your Draculas or whatever, your 19th century novels that are all about diary entries and, and exchange letters and stuff, you know what it is all about in that regard. It does feature a lot of, you know, cameo appearances by all kinds of science fiction and fantasy writers, pulp writers of the 1950s and 60s. So if you're a fan of, say, Isaac Asimov or Robert Heinlein, anything that <laughs> that Mr. Campbell ever... Um, John W. Campbell ever edited. If you're interested in the history of science fiction, you'll love this book. It's very disrespectful and irreverent, but it's also brilliant, and it shows the love for science fiction that is at the core of all the things we do, because, you know, fantasy is part of science fiction. Let's not, you know, fuck around with that one. So, Here's my pitch. Go read this book if you're into science, fantasy and science fiction, if you're into, into the history of the genre, and if you like good detective stories. Also, if you don't get insulted if some of your heroes are painted in a less than glorious light. It's worth reading, and it asks some fundamental questions about literature, the nature of the universe, and all kinds of other things. And it's also, well, extremely well written and fun. So, get yourself a copy of The Circumference of the World, and, well... Read it quickly, and while I have a bit of a beer, we'll talk about, uh, you'll read it, and then we'll talk about why I think it's such a brilliant book. All right, here we are. Let's talk about it. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Let's, let's look at why I think this book does a lot of things that work really well, and because... And while I think uh, why I think it's not so much about the scientific concept about you know the universe having ended and everyone being just reconstituted memories around um, you know orbiting that um, those black holes, I don't think that's the core of the story. It's a fun science fiction story. It's a concept that's been around for a while. If you want to read a really brilliant exploration of the whole concept, go read Brazil by um, Ian MacDonald. It's a fantastic story, and it deals with those kinds of questions in, well, more detail, and also gives you, like, a really interesting look at Brazilian culture. So, there you go. Um, so, we'll not talk about 
the question whether we're all dead already and just reconstituted memories orbiting the rim of a black hole. I don't think that is helpful. I don't think that is what this book is about. This book is about the power of ideas, the power of literature, and the difference between stories and meanings, because I think that's where the heart of this lies, and it's something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and I think this will help us explore it. It's also all about um, the history of science fiction and uh, the things that happened, and why maybe some aspects of science fiction have fallen by the wayside, and why that is sad. All right, let's let's go through these things one by one. And let's start with the last part <laughs> I mentioned. Let's talk about the history of science fiction, the history of fantasy, and why things have changed, maybe. See, the focus of this is like the 50s and 60s, what you might call the golden age of science fiction, when people like Asimov and Ray Bradbury and Robert A. Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke, all of these people were, you know, publishing books, mostly Heinlein, Clarke and um, Asimov, which are sort of like the, uh, the big three evil gods of science fiction of the time. There's obviously all these other people that get their light, uh, their, their, you know, chance to stand in the light, but it's those three and a lot of, like, other what you might call classic sci-fi. And uh, <clears throat> this book is clearly a love letter to that time, to all these great ideas of how the world might, might work, how the future might look, and where these where things might go. And, you know, they didn't. <laughs> um, we, we've all made the jokes about, like, where's my flying cars, uh, the car, and all of that stuff. But I think there's a different aspect to it that I think is important here. And that is, a lot of these authors were incredibly optimistic. They're not, you know, perfect in, at any sense. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going wrong with those authors. But a lot of their stories are fundamental looks at, like, how society could be, and how society should be, and how society might be. They're inventive. They're looking at all kinds of different aspects of the future. You read Asimov's robot stories. You read Asimov's um, foundation stories. You read Robert A. Heinlein's weird things like Stranger in a Strange Land or The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which is wrong because it's way too libertarian, but it's still, it's all about what you might call utopias. Not necessarily utopias in the way we would phrase them these days, but it's about the future is open, we can make it whatever we can dream about. And that's part of what makes the golden age of science fiction so interesting and so fascinating. That dream, that idea that maybe something great could come of this. And when you look at science fiction and fantasy these days, that's rarely what happens. There's, there's a distinct lack of positive science fiction that gives us really new and interesting um, looks at the, at the future. I would say that Ian M. Banks' culture novels are one case where we have a positive look at the future. There's others, but they're not the big thing. Like, starting with the 80s and what all the things that happened at the time, probably as a reaction to neoliberalism and so forth, Science fiction turned real dark, real fast, and dystopias have been the main thing of the future, of the books that are writing about, are written about the future, ever since. It starts with cyberpunk, but it continues to be like, the future is usually dark. When we look at science fiction these days, the future is dark. And we've lost some of those dreams, I think, and we've lost, maybe we've lost the ability to dream. And I think, at one level, the circumference of the world is a callback to the time when we still dared to dream, when we still did that in literature, when we, you know, when science fiction nerds did hang out and not just discuss about, you know, individual books, but about these ideas and dreaming of a better future. And, and this is, I think, the next big step here, what it all means, how it all works, the meaning of the universe. You know, that's, that's one thing that we need to focus on here, and that is meaning. Now, this will come up in, in other circumstances in the future, but when we talk about books these days, what we talk about a lot is we talk about form. We talk about characters, world building, magic systems, tech systems, all of that stuff, and how they are executed. We talk about prose, sometimes at least, uh, even though we rarely know what we mean by that, but we do. We talk about all of these technical aspects of the craft of writing, but we rarely talk about the meaning behind it all, what it means, these ideas, these great dreams, what's the actual meaning of the universe, is there something there, is there a truth behind it? And a lot of these science fiction authors of that time did kind of ask that question implicitly by 
imagining different futures and interesting futures because you can't imagine a future if you don't have like an idea or a wrestling with the questions like is there a meaning to it all what should it be like what's what's that what's the goal what's the meaning and we've lost that question or the ability to ask that question in a lot of ways and i, I think that's one aspect that makes this book so good because it kind of drags that back out and it does so in, well, frightening ways, because while I do believe that looking at the future and trying to wrestle with the truth and trying to find out what the truth is, um, I think that's important, especially when it comes to, you know, creating a better future. But there's obviously also, well, dark sides to this. And I think that's that's the next big question here is like, is it always worth asking the question for the meaning? Because people that are asking that question that are looking for a meaning, for a sense in life and what they do. A lot of these people nowadays would be considered somewhat weird, somewhat odd, outsiders in a lot of ways. And I think that's that's where we're having to go where we have to go with this. Because see, the people looking for this book, looking for load stars in this book that may or may not answer all these questions. Most of these people are what you might call weird or outsiders. They're outsiders, right? <laughs> Levi Armstrong is an outsider. He's a bit of a weird one. He takes drugs, he's maybe neurodivergent in some ways. You don't know, but he's, he's a weird one. Oscar Lenz has some severe fucking trauma from like his time in a, <laughs> in a Siberian um, a prison camp, right? Labor camp. And, and these people are asking for answer, you are looking for meaning. I mean, that's that's sort of where I think this has to uh, this has to go because people that are well adjusted and live within the system, we live within um, the world that we've built. We we're not we're not used to asking for meaning. We're used to asking for like the the formal things, the questions that we used to ask ourselves and that we we're kind of trained to ask ourselves, like how do I get money for the next day? How do I do this? These are how questions. They're not why questions. But people that are on the outside that have somehow been betrayed or, well, not accepted by the system that we've built for ourselves, that's the, that's when you start asking the, the why question. And I think sometimes that goes down really dark paths. And I think that's that's sort of the warning within this, within, within this book. And this is where we have to go back, right? There's depictions of mental health issues, both with Levi and with Oscar. There's... Certainly, some form of trauma may be going on there with um, with our uh, main heroine uh, Delilah. Is that her name? I keep forgetting her name. It's a problem. Um, see, we have these ideas in there, but like none of the people that are actually sincerely looking for a truth in fiction, for a sense, for meaning in fiction, none of these people are actually what you might call well-adjusted. Um, center of the road mainstream people they're all somewhat outsiders even daniel chase is obviously with his disability a bit of an outsider and and, and that counts because see there's there's that idea that a lot of fantasy and science fiction people are nerds and sort of outsiders that obviously that is no longer the truth and i feel part of that is once again the idea that we've come back to the question of like to that point where we don't ask those why questions anymore we ask the how questions and the circumference of the world kind of starts with people asking the why question. And sometimes that goes horribly wrong because people that ask those why questions, the why is it? How can I change it? Where can we go? People who do ask these questions, the fundamental questions, are often outsiders to begin with. They feel, we feel, we feel out of place. We feel somewhere, somehow marginalized, somehow pushed to the side. And that does do things to us that can harm us, that can do terrible things. And sometimes the answers we come up with after we've been, you know, crushed by the system, sometimes these answers aren't really good or are dark answers. And sometimes if we're looking for these for answers, we find them and we twist them even further. And that's exactly what happens both to Levi and that happens um, to Oscar Lenz in a way. They find a truth. Is that truth real? It doesn't really matter, but it's sort of a thing that they're already damaged, they're already hurt. Minds and personalities can latch upon and 
out of pain often more pain comes and that's that's the dark side of that imagination that we used to use in science fiction is sometimes people come up with terrible things now that doesn't necessarily go for people like asimov although his belief in capitalism might be called called harmful it doesn't necessarily go for heinlein any of these people but there is always that danger that if you make your fiction if you make your art all about asking the big question the why is this how can we do something about that? If you make it about that, there is danger to that. Because you're asking a big question. You're not asking the easy question of like, how can I fit in? How do I not get into trouble? We're not asking those questions. We're asking the big ones. And, and all of the circumference of the world, with all the things that happen there, are about that about asking the big questions and the responsibilities that come with that, which is when you see letters like the one fictional letter of Robert A. Heinlein talking about like how he's just in it for the money because writing beats doing like all kinds of other jobs like that may be the thing for you Bob but <laughs> you're playing with a lot of people's minds because you're playing with ideas and you don't know who's going to read them and the responsibility of artists for their audience or what people take away from their art is one of those unasked questions of this book that kind of kind of come behind all of that. And I think that's that's all the serious stuff, why this book touched me, why I found it really powerful. But there's also, you know, all the fun stuff, <laughs> all the fun bits of having all these fantasy and science fiction writers show up and being irreverent to them, having Michael Moorcock and J.G. Ballard and all those, the New World's kids being pissed off about all the old timers and still doing the same kind of things, sort of, having fantasy scholar John Clute um, show up. All the cameos are a treat if you've ever looked into the history of fantasy and science fiction. If you're into that stuff, if you're, if you're a nerd about these kind of things, having all these people show up and just having the sheer joy that comes with, you know, being part of the outsider crew that asks the big questions, that think, you know, that what we're doing here can change the world. Having a, you know, sort of like a remembrance or paid homage to that feeling of being these people. That's really wholesome in a way. And that makes a lot of, it's a lot of fun. And I think that's the other part that makes this book so powerful is showing both the good of being the people that ask the big questions, being feeling important in a way and also the dark side of what damage that can do if people take it too far having all of that go into that i think is is really cool and using well <clears throat> eugene hartley slash l ron hubbard for that is a very clever thing to do is a very interesting answer because yes if that person is actually serious about what they are doing it does change the idea of running a grift. It does change things fundamentally. Plus also, <laughs> go check up on that biography of Elrond Hubbard because so many bits and pieces that show up in here, including the stuff with Jack Parson and doing the, the moon child um, sex magic stuff, all of that shit's real. And, and that's like the other part is so often the truth, even within our weird part of science fiction fantasy history, even there, things were much weirder than most of the books that we read, that these people wrote and that we read these days. And that's a nice reminder that, like, reality and fiction do overlap in a lot of ways after it all. And that's, that's all I have to say about The Circumference of the World. It's a fun little book. I really fucking enjoyed it. I hope you did too. I hope you're going to read it if you haven't and still followed me. I hope you appreciate my thoughts on the matter. Um... Let's have a bit of an argument in the comments, because, you know, arguing is what we're here for. Um, if you liked it, I don't know, press that like button. It even says like, you know. Um, subscribe if you haven't. Um, share the video if you want to annoy someone. If you really want to help me out, support me or whatever, there's some links where you can actually give me money in case, you know, because even I have to ask those how questions from time to time. It's like, how can I survive? Um, but beyond that, let's stick with the big ones. Let's talk about why in the comments. And until then... Thanks and cheers.